wild boar investigates the camera, unaware of the shining eyes of a leopard just a few meters behind him. And the ultimate reward, a tiger out hunting. The remote cameras free up Gordon to stalk the forest trails himself. This time of day is when tigers, leopards start to hurl about, actually probably half an hour ago. So um, I am walking along here, half expecting to bump into a big cat. Most of the time, kills take place at night time, so that's why tigers start to get active round about now. Heavens above. Oh, two. Two porcupines. There's no mistaking what these creatures are. There's nothing in this forest you could confuse them for. I've actually seen a tiger with a porcupine quill stuck in its throat, so even something as prickly as this is, is still a meal for a tiger. Camouflaged by the elephant's smell and sound, Justine's hoping the wildlife won't notice she's there. Going around with these elephants is the opposite of being stealthy and quiet. It's the opposite, really, of being a predator or being a tiger. But I think it's probably a good thing for, for prey animals because we don't seem like a threat to them. We're not trying to stalk them and trying to be quiet. And they probably just think we're a herd of elephants. Her thermal imaging camera picks up an animal's body heat and makes them easy to spot in the dark. I've got something here. Looks like a squirrel. Imagine they're climbing up. One's going way up. Up. Wow, what was that? It's a flying squirrel. It just went flying through the frame. I didn't realise there were flying squirrels here. That's a great find. Far to the east, Steve is searching the banks of the river. It's a little bit nerve wracking, wandering through this tall grass at night, knowing that this could be tiger territory and we could actually be being watched by a tiger right now. Whoa, this is by far the biggest spider I've seen in this part of the world, and it is absolutely furious. Look at it reared up. That's wonderful. This is one of the, the primitive spiders all over the world. They're known as tarantulas, big, hairy spiders that are heavy bodied uh, with downward pointing fangs and he's bound to have small venom glands at the top here and a bite from this would certainly really really hurt. Look how angry he is. He's actually got just hanging from one fang there the wing from I don't know it could be from a termite elate. That is absolutely remarkable. Justine's tactics with the elephants are working. Very bright eye shine. There's quite thick foliage in here. Just see if I can get closer to whatever's in here. It's quite hard to work out what it is exactly because it's all curled up, having a snooze. Looks very much like a civet to me. He's actually waking up now, pruning his tail. Oh, you can see, you see the head much better now. A oh, big yawn. That's definitely a civet. He's having a good old lick on his paw now. Beautiful. Probably going to be busy all night and then sleep all day. Oh, look, he's moving, he's moving. That's really nice. It's great on the thermal camera, you can really see the shape. Oh, jump! <laughs> it's gonna jump again there, there he goes. That was great. Gordon's found another pair of eyes reflected in his torchlight. Where are you? Oh, yeah, 
is, there is. Oh, you beautiful little cat. He's been looking for the largest cat, but has found the smallest, a leopard cat. Wow. It's tiny. It might be. Is that a youngster? I wonder. Yes. Oh, this is what it is about. It's on the move. It's kind of about the same size as a domestic cat, much longer legs. And spotted like a leopard. Beautiful. You know, these leopard cats, they'll catch small rodents, um, birds even. Eating grass at the moment. Whether it's a cat of this size or whether it's a cat the size of a tiger, there's just no denying them. They, they're just perfect, they really are. Steve's search for footprints has been frustrated by heavy rain, so he switched tack. Along the river, there's a handful of communities rarely visited by outsiders. Steve will try to gather local intelligence about whether they've seen tigers. So we have someone. When was it that you saw this tiger and, and where? <laughs> OK, this young man here has seen a tiger just up here, down by the river, about two weeks ago, which is pretty incredible. And, and where was it? So, he saw the tiger. Um, it was in the forest in the middle of the daytime, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and um, it saw him and began to move away from him, and, and this guy shouted at it, and it ran off. So. Um, do you and your friends and your family see tigers often, many times, or is this a very unusual thing for you? Um, yeah, this is this is really quite striking news. Um, so he wasn't on his own. There was there was three of him there: his father and somewhere else as well. So it's not like he's just kind of you know making it up. Um, and also, when I asked how often they see tigers, he said maybe once a month. Maybe once a month, sometimes every two months. Um, I mean, that is absolutely extraordinary. There must be a phenomenal amount of tigers moving through here for, for them to be any sightings at all, let alone regular sightings. Last thing that Alan said to me before I left base camp was that if you get any evidence from people who live around here that there are tigers here, even just one person saying that they've seen one, then that's going to be massive. Um, and you don't get any more definitive than that. Heartened by success, Steve continues on towards base camp. Back in camp, Alan is marking all confirmed tiger sightings on a map. Expedition biologist Rebecca Pradhan has spent many years trekking through western Bhutan, where she's seen tigers with her own eyes. And when I saw that's a tiger, I was just pinching myself, am really? I? So Were you scared? And it, no, it's quite a little bit far away. So then after some time, there's a two things also climb up. It's a little bit uh, like a dog, a little bit smaller than the dog size uh, mm, cubs. So also, both cubs were there. Today. So it was a female and uh, two cubs? Two cubs, yes. That's terrific. You've had more closed tiger encounters <laughs> than I have ever had. That's incredible. All of the data is now coming together. The fact that Rebecca has walked so much of Bhutan and has had first-hand sightings of tigers right in front of her, tiger prints right in front of her, females and cubs, all that is exactly the kind of data we, we need. And what this is showing is that large areas of Bhutan not only have tigers, but have tiger populations breeding. So the, so the source population that Bhutan will provide for the overall Himalayan tiger corridor now is growing and growing as we get more and more data. 
with so many tiger populations facing a genetic dead end. Bhutan's extensive forests could serve as a tiger nursery, helping to repopulate other areas of the Himalayas. More than ever now, I believe that Bhutan is the key to what I envisioned as the Himalayan corridor. If you think of the Himalayan corridor as a body, this really could be thought of as the heart, pumping blood out throughout the entire body, keeping it alive. Much of the rest of the body is starting to die, but this has the potential to, to not only keep it alive, but to invigorate the rest of the body. Upriver, Steve's expedition has come to an abrupt halt. Their path blocked by a near impossible rapid. They must judge whether there's a safe route through. Looks pretty scary. It does, doesn't it? It's quite intimidating, really. Yeah. It's a lot of water going downstream. How do you feel about it? Um, my concern is that if I make a mistake, you know, if I roll over up here somewhere and can't get back up again and get thrown into that washing machine, that would be a well, it'd be awful. Yeah, no, it wouldn't be much fun. It's one of those rapids, you've actually got to just pick your line, look exactly where you go, and that's what you concentrate on, and you just go for it, and make sure you nail it. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine, Dave. That looked like a hell of a run down the bottom. It looked violent as anything. Any advice for the raft just before we head on down? Yeah, Dave, you've just got to power left through those waves to begin with and just make sure you stay to the, to the side of that massive hole. I mean, you, you can't miss seeing it, but unfortunately, I think you could miss and get dragged into it. you just got to power on through that, I think. This river better not get any bigger than that. That is my absolute limit. But this place is out of this world. Back in camp, George is on bath duty. <laughs> this is great. Alan has a new mission for him. If Bhutan is to be at the heart of a massive tiger corridor, the team needs to discover what local people think about coexisting alongside big cats. Alan has asked George to trek to a settlement upriver. About a day's time. George, this is a really, really important trip that you're taking. If the corridor is, is gonna work, we know we've got the tigers here, the big cats, and we know that the young males are gonna disperse outward from here. What we have to know is if it can work once they go out into the human landscape where they pass by human settlements. So some of the stuff that's gonna be really vital is what the people feel about living among tigers. If they value it, if they accept it, if they're angry about it, they're gonna be one of our really important pieces to the puzzle. We'll have to do it about three times for this. Rebecca will introduce him to the people of Yamdang a small village three hours walk away. It's very waggy. Oh, oh yeah. Woo. I'm, very, I'm very scared. <laughs> I'm the I thought you, you'd be used to this. Yeah, no, but uh, you know, I walk, but I'm very scared. 